Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and the meeting is about to begin. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I have a scheduling adjustment to our board meeting today. Um, unfortunately, we um, need to reschedule uh, the hospital debrief, which is the second item on the agenda. So I um, am requesting that we move that remove that item from the agenda. It's likely that we'll be able to get back to that the first week of November, um, and that is the goal. So that would be moved to November 4th, but stay tuned on, on those updates. Um, in addition, I want to remind everyone that next week, Wednesday, October 28th, we have an all-day board meeting. It starts at 9 a.m. We'll be reviewing One Care Vermont's budget. And um, I actually, I, I, I can reach out later during um, this meeting and hear from Sarah. Or somebody's calling in here. Um, <laughs> okay, um, and Abigail, you may know if we received any public comments regarding the potential vote for today. We have not received any. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, October 14th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve last week's uh, minutes without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Hearing none, the, the motion carries. So we're now going to move on to um, a discussion. And before we do, I just want to make sure I, I see that Marilyn, um, I see your name on the uh, screen. Chris, are you on? Hi, this is Chris Whaler. I just stopped on. Great. Great. Super. So we're going to be talking about uh, new tools to help um, states address hospital costs. And we have two um, incredible guests today. Um, very fortunate uh, that uh, they were able to participate today, and especially with short notice. Um, there was a webinar last week, and a few members from the Green Mountain Care Board, including Member Holmes, um, participated and um, really were fascinated by the research being done and wanted to um, see if the whole board could uh, be briefed on what was happening. And very fortunately, both uh, Christopher and Marilyn uh, um, seize the opportunity and are here today. So just briefly by way of introduction, um, Christopher Willey is a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and professor at the Party RAND Graduate School. His research focuses on using large scale medical claims data to examine how information and financial incentives influence patients choice of providers how providers respond to changes in consumer incentives, and how employers and insurers can design insurance benefits to promote value. His research has been published in a variety of clinical health policy and economics journals. He is the lead author of a JAMA paper that examines the effects of online price transparency information. This paper was a finalist for the 2015 National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation Annual Healthcare Research Award. He also received the 2015 AHRQ Research Conference Director's Award for a paper published in JAMA Internal Medicine that examines the effect of reference pricing on consumer choice of providers for cancer screening services. Chris has a BA in economics from the University of Chicago and a PhD in health economics from the University of California, Berkeley. Also with us today is Marilyn Bartlett. Marilyn earned a bachelor's degree in education from the University of Nevada and taught high school and 
This is not my editorializing. It's in her brief bio, an experience that sent her promptly back to school to complete the accounting finance program at Montana State University, Billings. She then became a CPA followed by CMA, um, CGMA, and CFM designations. Marilyn turned immediately to the business world, holding financial management positions in various industries. Her focus narrowed to healthcare financial management, serving as controller for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Montana, CFO for a regional TPA, and special projects coordinator for the Montana Commissioner of Securities and Insurance. Marilyn then took the helm of the State of Montana Employee Benefit Plan in late 2014. Moving the plan from uh, projected reserves of minus 9 million to 112 million in less than three years. She disrupted the status quo by implementing reference based contracting with all Montana hospitals. Transparent pass through pharmacy benefit, enhanced primary care on site health clinics, vendor management systems, cloud based enrollment administration system and a cloud-based data warehouse. For her accomplishments, she appeared in an article co-published by National Public Radio and ProPublica. She was selected number 13 of Fortune Magazine's World's 50 Greatest Leaders of 2019 and was recently inducted into the Montana Business Hall of Fame by Montana State University Billings. Marilyn currently serves as a Senior Policy Fellow for the National Academy of State Policy, NASHPE, addressing hospital pricing. So with those brief introductions in order, Marilyn and Chris, who would like to uh, kick this off? Uh, <laughs> happy to go either way. Um, and so, so whether it be helpful to have a high level overview of hospital yeah. prices or have, um, dive into Maryland's class tool. Either, either is fine with me. I think it's best for uh, Ram to go first, for Chris to go first, because then I'll pick up how we use his information. Okay, Chris, you've won the coin toss. <laughs> <laughs> All right, lucky me. <laughs> um, so let me share my screen. Uh, so can everyone see my screen? I cannot. Not yet. Sometimes it takes a couple of seconds. I think it's moving. Okay. Does does that work? Yes, it does. It works. Great. All right. Great. Uh, well, really excited to be here and to, to talk about some of our, our work on hospital prices. Just some, some quick acknowledgments. This study was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And uh, this is a, a study that was really kind of the brainchild of an employers forum group out of Indiana and had the, the opportunity to work with a really fantastic study team at, at RAND on this project. So why, why we got interested in this study particularly is that if we look at kind of the, the healthcare ecosystem in the United States, about half of, of people in the, the indivi or individuals in the US receive health insurance through an, an employer. Collectively, employer sponsored plans spend about $1.2 trillion a year on healthcare, with the largest portion of that pie, about $480 billion, going to hospitals. And so, thinking about, about hospital prices and dollars that are going to hospitals is something where we think that there is a, if we're thinking about kind of rating and spending, that's an opportunity that, that maybe we want to look at. And if we look at what's kind of known about hospital prices in general, uh, we, we know that they are higher than, than what Medicare pays, or rather private insurers pay higher prices for hospital care than Medicare pays. This study, or this, this table uses data from, from uh, Medicare data to look at just average prices for, for private insurance in the blue line, and then also Medicare in the orange line and Medicaid in the gray line. Over the last couple of years, private prices, private insurance prices rather, have been a lot higher than Medicare and Medicaid prices, and have also been increasing at a faster rate. And so why, why I personally think this is important is that when we think about healthcare spending, I think it's really important to think 
not just about, about spending and, and uh, healthcare dollars in the vacuum, but to really think about affordability and where those dollars are coming from. So in a paper that, that we released this summer, we looked at how uh, healthcare dollars eat into wages for the, the privately insured population. And so here in the, the top blue line, we have average uh, wages for, for American workers in, in uh, inflation adjusted terms. And then health insurance costs or the, the amount of the costs employed to provide insurance for their worker population. Over the last decade, take home wages for workers have been flat and health insurance costs have increased steadily. And so I, I think there's a, a growing concern that healthcare costs are, are eating into to wages and workers are now getting paid essentially in healthcare dollars rather than in take home dollars. There's a, I think, an also growing concern that healthcare markets are changing quite a bit and that this places pressure on healthcare affordability. So in the, the left-hand side, what we've done is look at prices for hospital care for the privately insured population following hospital mergers. And so the, the dashed vertical line indicates when a, a hospital merger occurred. And what we find is that healthcare prices go up by about $500 following a hospital merger. And then on the right hand side, we look at what happens to wages in the exact same markets. And so when a hospital merges or when a market has a hospital merger, prices for hospital care go up as seen on the left and wages for workers go down as seen on the right by about the same amount. And so if we think about what we kind of already know about healthcare, uh, uh, in hospital prices, we, we know that the prices paid by private health plans are, are higher and growing faster than, than the rates paid by Medicare or even Medicaid. And if we look at, at a host of other studies, we know that if either we look at uh, variations in healthcare spending in the United States or compare the United States to other countries, the increases in, in overall spending are really driven by differences in prices and not by differences in, in utilization or use of services or population health. And we also know that broadly prices vary from market to market, and even within a market, vary within uh, different providers within that market. But what we don't know is, is how prices compare across the country and what markets actually have the highest prices versus, versus other markets. We don't know if, if prices are continuing to rise over the last couple of years. And then more importantly, if you, it's, it's one thing to know that there's lots of price variation, but if you're really going to design policies that address prices, you have to know which providers are high priced and which providers are low priced. And so right now we don't have a really good sense on which hospitals or systems are actually high priced. And I, I think this really kind of ties into the, the, the reason that we did this study is that right now we don't know whether the prices that individual self-funded employers are paying and if these prices are in line with the value that payers are getting for, for their healthcare dollars. And thinking about the, the role of either the employer or the plan sponsors in, in the, the healthcare system, uh, most, many employer plans are in, in other uh, uh, plans are, are what's called self-funded. And so under this type of model, there's a fiduciary responsibility for the plan sponsor and also everyone else involved in allocating resources to make sure that they're done so efficiently and at the best interest of the, the, the patient and, and their families. And so as we're thinking about kind of what's the, the role of, of everyone uh, who touches dollars and is involved in the healthcare ecosystem, it's hard to know how, how well those individuals and those organizations can ensure that they're meeting their fiduciary responsibility if we don't even know basic things like prices. And so just to, to acknowledge the, the unique time that we're in, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has placed a tremendous amount of financial pressure on both hospitals and employers. Hospitals and, and other health professionals are critical members of, of their communities, and we need to make sure that they, they stay in business and continue to provide care. But at the same time, health benefits are, are one of the largest expenses for many employers and organizations. And, and we, we also need to, to make sure that uh, families and workers, uh, following some of the earlier slides I presented, do uh, have the ability to, to earn take-home pay and not just get paid in health care dollars. 
And so as we're thinking of the, the impact of COVID on the healthcare delivery system and also the, the financial health of, of just the, the U.S. economy as, as a whole, we, we think that now kind of more than ever is an important time to, to actually have good and transparent information about healthcare prices. And so we, uh, with this in mind, um, uh, undertook a study where we, we've collected lots of data that I'm going to describe in a couple of minutes. And to, to be clear, as we're thinking about measuring prices, we, we as researchers actually don't know what the right price is for, for hospital care. But at the same time, individual purchasers and, and employers and other organizations can't act as responsible for these sharies and, and uh, uh, maintain their fiduciary responsibility if they don't have accurate price information. And so what we really wanted to do in this study is give employers and other organizations information that allows them to be smart shoppers for healthcare and to make sure that they are actually getting uh, uh, adequate value for their healthcare dollars on behalf of their employees and their other uh, individuals who rely on them for benefits. This is the third wave of the, the RAND hospital price transparency study. And so in our, our first study, we actually just looked at Indiana and got data from, from employers. Last year, we expanded that to look at 25 different states. And for that study, we, we continue to get data for, from employers. We also got data from, from health plans and also from two all-payer claims databases. There, we, in, in the, the study last year, we looked at both inpatient and outpatient hospital prices, but primarily just looking at hospital facility fees. In the study that, that we released a, about a month ago, we were able to expand our study to, to 49 states. We, we excluded Maryland because they have a, a unique all-payer rate setting model. We continue to get data from employers, health plans, but expanded to, to six all-payer claims databases. We, uh, we unfortunately did not get the Vermont all-payer claims database, but did get the New Hampshire and the main APCD data. And we, we again looked at inpatient and, and outpatient services for both facility and professional fees, and then also looked at some procedure level differences in prices. And so, it, as I, I mentioned, uh, we, we obtained a large host of claims data from a variety of different organizations. We measured prices in, in two different ways, and so I'm going to uh, describe these in, in detail in a couple of minutes. And so our first way is relative to Medicare, and so this is essentially exactly how much Medicare would have paid for the exact same service. And then also prices per a, a case mix weight. And so this I is what we call the Uh, is is download and website, and this is our, our, our pool or a report that pools data across our entire data collection sample. This uh, report also has supplemental material that's on the RAND website where we actually name specific hospital uh, systems and facilities. And so you can actually go into to the RAND website and see estimates of prices for about 3,000 hospitals. And then we also have an option for large for for employers to to receive a, a uh, report that just looks at their specific population. So when we're thinking about comparing prices, this is something that's not entirely straightforward. And every single hospital uh, is 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 totally different. Sees the patients in, in those types of procedures. And so if we were just to say compare average prices across hospitals, that would be pretty misleading to do. And so what we do is we actually leverage the Medicare system to, to, to uh, build on some of the, the work that Medicare has developed over the last several decades to help standardize across different hospitals and to make more of an apples to apples comparison. And so we, we call this the, the making a, an apple pie, but like many, many things uh, are baking, there's multiple ways to do things. And so we're gonna have two different recipes to, to make this pie. And so our, our first is, is what we call the percent of Medicare. And so this is kind of a, the, the metric that, that we most commonly use, largely because it, I think it's the easiest to understand. And so what this, this measure is, is it, it represents how much employers and, and private health plans pay relative to what Medicare would have paid 
for the exact same service at the exact same hospital. And so for every service that we see a, a privately insured individual receiving, we use the Medicare payment for it, formulas to say how much would Medicare have paid for that exact same service at that exact same facility. This is pretty easy to interpret and it's also easy to compare across hospitals. And so if we see that one hospital is getting paid 300% of Medicare, another hospital is getting paid 200% of Medicare, that's a pretty easy comparison that allows us to tell which hospital is less expensive than the other hospital. The other advantage is that the Medicare system adjusts for, for cost of living and wage differences. And so if you're getting hospital care in, in New York City versus Kansas, maybe it's a, you, you want to account for those differences in, in cost of living and cost of hiring doctors and nurses in payment. Our, our second approach is what we call the standardized prices approach. And here, we're, we're, we're not going to compare relative to Medicare, but we're actually going to still leverage a lot of the, the, the Medicare uh, payment model. And in the Medicare payment model, Medicare has essentially figured out how much more resources it costs to provide different types of services. And so for just a, a quick example, in the Medicare system, Medicare and, and CMS has figured out that it costs about three, 30 or exactly 34.65 times more to perform a heart transplant than to treat a patient for chest pains. And they've done this for, for every type of service uh, that, that you can imagine. And so we're gonna use these relative uh, procedure differences to make a comparison across hospitals that standardizes across the, uh, the different types of procedures that, that they perform. And so the, the way we, we think about this is this is the, the average walk out the door amount and we're able to get a, actually a dollar uh, level difference in prices. The other advantage of this approach is that it doesn't incorporate differences in, in Medicare payments that are specific to each hospital. So uh, some examples include Medicare pays academic or teaching hospitals more than non-academic hospitals. Medicare reimburses hospitals more if they receive uh, or if they treat lots of uncompensated care patients. And we, we don't uh, have to worry about those differences in this approach. And so, so just to be clear about the, the comparison to, to Medicare, we, we are using the, the Medicare system as a, a benchmark and not as a price endpoint. So what, what I mean by that is that we're, we're using the, the payment models that Medicare has developed to compare private prices between different hospitals and not necessarily to say that the private hospitals or private payers should be paying the exact same as what Medicare pays. It's, the, the, the Medicare system is not a um, perfect benchmark to use, but it's hard to think of what a, a better benchmark would be. And I, I think this is really true for, for two reasons. So one, the, the Medicare system uh, is, and the Medicare reimbursement logic is, is totally transparent. So we can actually go, or you, you know, we, or you can go to the, the CMS website and download the, the payment models uh, for, for specific hospitals and know exactly how much uh, the, the Medicare system pays for, for different hospitals. The Medicare uh, payment model has also been developed over the last several decades with lots of input from, from industry and other stakeholders. And so this is something where I think we have a pretty good consensus that the, the Medicare system uh, is at least empirically based in, in how they, they pay prices. And so we, we think that, that using the system as a benchmark really allows employers and other health plans and other uh, organizations within the private insurance market to compare prices between hospitals and then also relative to the largest purchaser of healthcare services in the world. Uh, just a, a quick note on, on data protection. So the study was regulated by the RAN Human Subjects Protection Committee. Uh, we conduct, conducted all the analysis in a kind of similar uh, environment that we use to, to uh, analyze confidential Medicare data uh, and have lots of DUAs and, and human subjects training in place. And so what do we find? Uh, so, so the the kind of top level finding is that the the prices paid by employers and other private health plans relative to Medicare has increased pretty rapidly over the last couple of years. And so, if we go back to 2016, prices paid by employers and health plans were 224 percent of Medicare. This increased to 230 percent in 2017, and then up to 247 percent in 2018. Rather, across the board, this is about a five percent increase per year. 
And keep in mind that, that this is on top of the, the inflation adjustments that are already baked into the Medicare system. And so this is the, the gap between the uh, between private health plans and payers relative to Medicare, not just price increases overall. We also found pretty wide variation in, in prices. And so this looks at, at prices for both uh, facility and professional fees. And in the, the, the red dots, or the, the, the red squares rather, uh, has overall inpatient and, and outpatient. The circles look at just inpatient prices and the triangles look at just outpatient prices. If we look at, at prices overall, there's a, a pretty wide variation. And so while, while the average is 247%, it ranges from below 200% in states like Arkansas and Michigan, all the way up to, to over 350% uh, uh, in states like, like South Carolina. And so if, if we look across states, uh, uh, there's almost a 2x variation in hospital prices across the different states in our, in our sample. And if we look at, at how much uh, uh, prices vary for, for facilities, we, we again find the, the same levels of variation. And so if we look at just the, the facility prices, uh, we, we find a range from below 200% of Medicare in, Thanks, and, in, Ar in Arkansas to, to uh, close to 350% Medicare in South Carolina and West Virginia. Vermont is, is actually pretty close to the national average at about uh, exactly 250% Medicare. And if, instead of looking at, at facility fees, if we look at how much doctors and other healthcare providers make, we find uh, similar levels of variation, although the, uh, the, the order is flipped pretty considerably. And so uh, in states like Delaware and Kentucky, physicians and other health professionals are reimbursed at almost exactly the same amount as Medicare. In, in states like Minnesota and, and Alaska, the rate is above 350% Medicare. Vermont is again, pretty, pretty uh, uh, close to the middle of the pack at around 200%, just under 200% Medicare. We also looked at the, the gap between facility fees and professional fees by state. And so here, uh, similar to, to the previous two charts, in some states like Minnesota and Rhode Island, professionals make quite a bit more relative to Medicare than, than facilities. And in states like Indiana and West Virginia, there's about a 200 percentage point gap between facility fees and professional fees. Vermont is, is again, uh, uh, close to the middle. Uh, in the sense that facility fees are, are slightly above professional fees, but we don't see the same wide gap as, as for other uh, other states. And then if you also look at, at the range within prices or within states, we, we found that in many states, there's actually more price variation within that state than if you were to compare prices across states. And so this, this plot shows the, the 75th and 25th and 50th percentile uh, of prices across states. And, and we find that in many states, there, there are huge, uh, there's a huge range of prices within that state. And one of the, the results that surprised me is we also found the same result for, for variation in prices within health system. And so going into the, the study, I, I actually expected that, that prices would be pretty uh, standard within the same health system, but we actually find pretty wide variation in, in prices across different uh, hospitals within the same system. And then so I also mentioned that we, we did look at prices for specific procedures. We, we actually didn't have enough data for, from uh, Vermont to look at, at uh, uh, procedures, specific prices for specific uh, procedures. Uh, but we do have quite a bit of data from the Maine and New Hampshire APCDs. And so uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the, the high level findings that we were able to get from, from those APCDs as a, a uh, test case of how data from APCDs can act actually be applied. And so what, one of the things we, we did uh, is also look at differences in labor and delivery prices. 
And so, for example, in the state of Maine, we find that the labor and delivery prices range pretty, pretty considerably. And if we look at the state of New Hampshire, we, we also find uh, comparable levels of, of price variation where prices for, for labor and delivery range from about $7,000 all the way up to about $25,000. And the same thing for orthopedic surgery, we find uh, re really similar uh, 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 ranges in prices where, where prices for orthopedic surgery range from about $5,000 to over $30,000. And if we repeat the same, same exercise in, in uh, New Hampshire, we find similar levels of variation, but, but not, not quite as large. Uh, so here, instead of, of a minimum of about $5,000, here we find a minimum of about $8,000 and prices range to about $25,000 instead of $30,000. We also looked at the link between price and quality. And so th this uh, figure shows price in um, uh, 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 three kits. And so we, we categorize hospital prices as those which we call low price, so hospitals less than 150% of Medicare those with prices between 150 and 250 percent of Medicare, and those with prices above 250 percent Medicare is the high price hospitals. And then we, we looked at two different quality definitions. And so we, we used data, data from the, the Medicare Hospital Star System. And so this uh, brings hospitals between five stars, so those with the highest quality, and one star with the lowest quality. And then we also use safety score data from, from the LeapFrog group where we have data uh, that ranks hospitals from grade A, the, the most safe hospitals to a grade F, those are the, the least uh, uh, safe hospitals. And so for, for both measures of, of, of prices or of quality rather, we do find some link between price and quality, but it's a, it's a pretty weak link. And so we find many high price hospitals that are low quality and also many low price hospitals that have high quality. And so as, as we're thinking about hospitals and the relationship between price and quality, I think it's really important to think about price and quality for individual hospitals rather than think about the hospital sector as a whole. And then the, the last test we did is we looked at the relationship between patient mix and, and uh, prices for hospital care. What One of the, the, the pushbacks that we've gotten uh, as we've done the, the study over the last couple of years is that hospitals have to charge high prices to account for underpayment from Medicare and, and Medicaid. And so if that's the case, then we should find that hospitals that have lots of Medicare or Medicaid patients are the ones that end up charging high prices. And hospitals that have fewer Medicare or Medicaid patients actually have relatively low prices. And so if that's the case, then on this plot, we should find more or less a 45 degree line and higher prices for those that have more Medicare and Medicaid patients. Instead, as you can see, this looks like essentially a, a random scatter of dots, and we actually don't find any correlation between hospital price and, and their, their share of patients that come from public payers, suggesting that, that it's other factors such as, as hospital reputation or hospital market structure and the, the ability to, to charge higher prices that lead to, to variation in private prices and not changes or differences in Medicare and Medicaid payment rates. So just to uh, kind of wrap up on, on where maybe uh, th these results could be taken. So as we think about what's the, the spectrum where, where employers or other organizations can use these results, I, I think there's kind of really uh, three points. And so uh, some, some groups have, have taken this information to finally have information about prices. Some have used this data to actually benchmark prices. And then some have used it to, to actually change hospital networks. And so as, as an example of, of uh, having information about prices and, and using this, this data to, to inform uh, decision-making, uh, one example is the, uh, the hospital value report produced by the Colorado Business Group on Health. And they used our, our price data from, from last year and combined it with pretty granular 
all the information that they've collected to think about uh, the relationship between price and quality within the, their market and think about what are the, the high value hospitals in, in Colorado. And then also to propose specific options to both Colorado employers and the, the state of Colorado legislature to, to address prices. Employers are also using this data to, to benchmark prices. And so I, I mentioned earlier that this study came out of the, the employers from Indiana is really their, their brainchild. And so after seeing the, the variation in especially outpatient care prices, the employers form of Indiana actually pushed their insurer to, to benchmark prices to a percent of Medicare. And so this is kind of similar to the, the price mechanism being proposed in a lot of public option policies where employers pay a percent of, of what Medicare pays and they actually put in place this program in, in January of this year. And so I, I think it'll be really good to see over the, the next year or so how, how this type of, of price cap leads to savings for, for employers in Indiana. And I think the, the final way is, is many employers are actually using this data to, to really push on, on the negotiations and prices that are being negotiated on their behalf. And so when we did the report last year, we identified a hospital in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, as being one of the most expensive hospital systems in the country. And if you're a, uh, so this is, you know, got a lot of attention uh, from, from policymakers, but I think what really got a lot of attention was from the Fort Wayne employer community, who were essentially not, not happy to see that they were paying probably the most expensive hospital prices in the world. And so what they did is they, they told their insurer, look, now that we've got better information on, on the prices that you're out negotiating on our behalf, we are gonna actually use this data to hold you accountable. And if you don't do a better job in negotiating prices, we're gonna move our business to an insurer that actually does do a better job. And so there, there was a, a new contract that was negotiated uh, over the, actually the summer. And the, the new contract, which uh, uh, benchmarks prices closer to, to Medicare, is expected to save over a five-year period over $600 million to Fort Wayne employers. And so th those are, are kind of three uh, broad actions that employers or employer groups have taken. But I, I think there's also a, an important role for, for state and federal policymakers. And as we talked about kind of the, the role of employers shifting patients to, to lower price hospitals, uh, it's important to recognize that in many markets, many employers and purchasers just don't have lots of options. And so if we look at the kind of a, the standard definitions of a competitive market that's used by the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice, about 70% of, of U.S. Uh, metropolitan markets are, are, are meet, meet the kind of the, the legal thresholds of the concentrated. And so in those markets, employers may just not have a lot of these uh, same type of options that I highlighted earlier. And so in those types of markets, I, I think it's important for employers to push states to do a couple different options. And so these can include things like implementing all payer claims databases. And so uh, the, the state of Vermont has an EPC. And so I think that's a really good first step. I think the another option is to, to promote policies that promote hospital or provider competition and eliminate gay clauses, clauses in hospital insurer contracts that, that help uh, stein the, the flow of price information. I think also limiting out-of-network charges can be something that can place pressure on, on in-network prices and, and really change how, how hospital prices are negotiated. And then and finally, I mentioned that we, we didn't include the state of Maryland at all because they have a really unique all-payer global budget setting. And so those types of policies might be something that, that might be useful if, if we're thinking about standardizing prices within the state. And so just to wrap up, um, I think that rising healthcare costs place a tremendous amount of pressure on worker wages. And I think this is especially true during the COVID pandemic. The, the glass half empty uh, 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 outcome of our study is that the, the wide variation in, in hospital prices creates lots of waste in the US healthcare system and, and drives lots of unnecessary spending. But I think the, the glass uh, half, half full story is that this actually can create a potential opportunity for savings. And so if you're in a market with lots of high price hospitals or your patients are going to high price hospitals and there are lower price hospitals that are, are nearby, then there's a potential savings opportunity for, for shifting demand to lower price hospitals. 
employers and others in the healthcare ecosystem, you know, the purchasers really need to demand transparent information on the prices that they, and especially their, their employees are paying for healthcare. And then they need to not just demand and access this information, but also think about using it, it in ways to innovatively inform the benefit design strategy. So thank you, uh, happy to turn it over to Marilyn and answer any questions. Kevin, you're on mute. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> I wondered why I didn't get any response from Marilyn. <laughs> oh, great. Yes. And I'm just uh, trying to, to figure this out. So I truly apologize to you. I've not done this on Teams, and I hope you'll be patient with me. Your time. And well, while you're trying to figure to that out, I see that Elena has her hand raised. Elena, did, were you trying to point something out to us? A question. I think we're going to hold questions oh. until after Marilyn has spoken, okay. Elena. Great. Okay, I think... Um, hmm. Sometimes takes a couple of seconds once you start it. You might be able to tell it up on my screen, but when I do click share, it doesn't come up in that little screen below. Abigail, do you think you could share the slides from your screen? If if that'd be great. There they are. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, uh, as uh, Kevin mentioned, I am a senior policy fellow with Nashby, and we are under an Arnold Foundation grant to look at hospital uh, costs. So as such, we developed a ho hospital cost tool. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, our hospital cost tool, uh, the goal was to help purchasers and regulator, regulators better understand hospital costs. There's information out on hospital prices, but nothing in a national public arena of hospital costs other than the Medicare cost reports. So we use the Medicare cost reports to drill into some of the costs. costs. And we're finding that employers are using our tool to help complement the recent findings that Chris just reported on. Now we're working with officials from several states that have reviewed the tool and they are looking at it in different ways. Uh, one is looking at it for insurance rate review. One is an analysis of hospital mergers. Uh, further informing hospitals' global budget parameters, and then specifically negotiating hospital reimbursements as a reference to Medicare rates as states are large purchasers of hospital services through their state employee health plan, corrections, uh, even some that are self-funded for workers' comp, et cetera. Next slide, please. So we use the hospital cost tool to take a look at Vermont hospitals. Now, um, next slide, thank you. Um, I want to say that this is just one tool of many things that your board already has available, and it is using information from the Medicare cost reports that are filed by the hospital and attested to by the hospital CEO, CFOs. 
but how they may classify costs, how you may look at it may be different depending on the tool you're using. So again, this is just one of tools that are out there that your board uses. Um, I wanted to just give a high level summary of what the Medicare cost report shows for the hospitals listed there, what their net patient revenue is, what their reserves are, and what their profit margin is. Again, just a high level overview uh, of this, what this tool will report out. Next slide, please. So what we did with this tool was we decided to drill down a little bit. One of the things that we're working on with one particular state, their legislative audit committee is looking very closely at charity care. And you'll see that what's reported on the 990 Schedule H will be charge master rates. You'll see what's reported in the Medicare cost report for a portion of charity care will be charge master rates because the DSH payments are dependent on that. But we go one step further in the tool and we calculate what is the true cost of charity care, uninsured and bad debt. And then what percentage is that of, um, uh, what percentage is that of your overall um, operating expenses? And I think that's an important thing for state regulators to look at. We're starting to see some states wanting to delve more into coming up with their own reporting on what truly is charity care. So this using the tool, this is how the hospitals played out. Vermont hospitals. Next slide, please. There's always a delay coming from Hardwick on that slide change. <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. It gives me time to think. <laughs> okay, now we use the Medicare cost report to allocate payer mix by looking at charge master or gross payments. Now, what I haven't shown on here is that we do carve out as the payer mix uh, the charity care, bad debt, and uninsured. Now, overall, for the average of the Vermont hospitals was 3%, but we do have that available. I just did not put it on this slide because I wanted to care, cover payer mix versus profit loss. Now, our numbers are going to be different a little bit from uh, the calculations that you have within your board. And Patrick and I have talked about that. And there's reasons for the different reporting. And again, I want to emphasize this is just one tool. Now, we calculate the profit or loss on Medicare, Medicaid, and then commercial includes all of commercial. It will include TRICARE, self-pay, insurance carriers, employer self-funded plans, and within the commercial, there's going to be varying amounts paid. I wanna show you the Medicaid column though. Now I want to alert you that the way the tool looks at this is that the hospital is required to report on schedule S10 what the charges, costs, and receipts were for Medicaid. It also requires reporting for any other state or local low-income programs, S-CHIP, et cetera. Um, what I did find when looking at the Vermont hospitals is it appears you have a, a distribution of provider fee. Now, in most states, that is captured under this Schedule S-10, but it appeared to me that a lot of these hospitals are reporting that as other income. They're not reporting it as associated with the Medicaid program, but are associating it with um, other income. And we'll, we'll look at the impacts of that. So I caution you on the Medicaid gain and loss. It's calculated off the self-reported S-10. And definitely your team will have worked through some of those concerns. Um, next slide, please. And we will wait while I think about what's on the next slide. Um, what the tool does is the next step is we calculate estimated break even points for the hospital. So what we're looking at here and let's look at the first one, for instance, Brattleboro. We're looking at break-even level one. 
And what level one says, what if commercial were to pay all of their own expenses plus any um, shortages or benefit from any overages from government programs, charity care, bad debt, and uninsured? Break even level two is more a tool truing up in that that includes all Medicare allowed costs, whether they were over or under allocated, we pretty much true up to whatever the Medicare allowed costs were. Break even level three says, okay, we are going to pay, let commercial pay all of the Medicare disallowed costs. Now, when I negotiated with the hospitals in Montana, that was a big point that was brought up is if you're going to use Medicare reference-based pricing, Medicare disallows for a lot of costs. And so we did delve into that. But on Brattleboro, it is saying that uh, commercial would need to pay 169% of Medicare to break even. Now, one thing that we're going to go into a little bit is that our break-even point on level three, I say that it includes all of Medicare disallowed costs, but we did not bring back in physician direct patient services and physician private offices. So I will talk about that later. Now, break-even four is probably going to be the closest because then it brings in other income, other expense. And when you see a big drop from level three to level four, uh, in looking at the Vermont hospitals, it was mostly attributed to um, the fact that these additional payments uh, that were prospective payments to hospitals were included as other income. Uh, but you're also going to have investment income in there and other items. But most of the uh, big drop there I found was related to how those payments were brought in. And you know much better than I do the nature of those payments, whether they relate to Medicaid or not, or do they relate to a specific program? But I just want to alert you, those are in there. And uh, you can uh, see that on the Medicare cost report. Now, what we did then, we worked with uh, Chris and we looked at the RAN 3.0 Port. And we looked at, now this is just the hospital costs. Again, we're just looking strictly at hospital services. Other services a hospital provides like clinic and whatever, we have carved all that out. And so has RAND. This is just looking strictly at taking care of the patient through the hospital, just the facility as Chris mentioned. So we looked at the RAND relative price that employer self-funded plans were paying that participated in this survey. There was not enough data for the ones that are blank, but there was sufficient data that RAND did record that. And this gives you somewhat of a comparison um, uh, between hospitals and then a comparison to potential break-even points. Next slide, please. Now, I wanted to mention specifically physician costs is when I negotiated with hospitals, that became a discussion point, and it's a, it's a valid discussion point. And I wanted to show you what is going on. Now, the Medicare cost report in yellow, these are the costs that Medicare disallows. They do not allow physician professional direct patient services. And the position in the Medicare cost report rules is that these are services provided directly to a patient and are actually billed and paid for through other systems, whether it be RBRVS in Medicare, you have Medicaid fee schedules, you have provider network, physician network contracts with insurance companies and networks, but they are paid for in other payment mechanisms. The thought is that is the same with the physician private offices. So Medicare excludes those. Now Medicare also excludes uh, what they call rice levels. That is a calculation they do where they determine what is a reasonable compensation equivalent and where hospitals may be providing their or paying their providers higher than that, they disallow those. But what Medicare does allow is in the blue box, 
and that is defined as hospital services. That is defined as physician costs that are incurred for the general public use. It may be doctors within emergency care, within um, ICU, but those are hospital or hospitalists are gonna be there. Now our cost tool is disallowing the first two categories of physician professional direct services and physician private offices. But our cost tool uh, does allow for exceed reasonable compensation. We did not feel that was something that we had a position on. So when you look at our break even points, we are disallowing those first two columns. The other thing that's interesting to look at that when you do start working with hospitals, which I know you already do and have much more data, is um, I don't know this about Vermont. I do know about it with other states that we are working with is that some hospitals have purchased physician practices for numerous reasons and are losing money on them. And so in our negotiations with other states, um, hospitals have asked for those costs to be included because they are losing money on that segment. And it brings up a good theoretical argument about whether that is something, you know, should be included in hospital rates uh, if a hospital is losing money on a physician practice to keep that as a base. Or is it something, as Chris noted, physician payment uh, are, are usually much lower. So it's a good discussion point, but I want you to be aware of that. Next slide. So one thing that we wanted to do, we were asked by your board to take a look at, was comparing academic hospitals because they kind of are in the, uh, uh, a whole category of their own. So we did take a look at Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital in New Hampshire, and we took a look at Albany Medical Center Hospital just to try to see you know, were there any fair comparisons. Now this first one I found really interesting because the net patient revenue was not all that different, even though the hospital bed counts were different, and I don't have that here. And then you can see the profit margins roughly, and now again, this is Medicare cost reported information. Now the payer mix I have excluded, uh, it does not include the charity care and bad debt. And again, this is how the Medicare cost report would. Um, it tells you the payer mix and the profit loss. Again, I caution you on Medicaid because I also found this in New Hampshire that those fees, there are fees coming in as other income. But this is to look at academic centers. Next slide. We looked at academic centers beyond these two charts. We looked at them through the rest of the cost model too. And we calculated the break evens. And again, I show you those four points. Now level four, look at um, the Mary Hitchcock and University of Mont Vermont. You see that big drop between break even level three and break even level four? That's most likely that there is uh, revenue included as other income that uh, might not be attributable to a specific program with how that report is filled out. Now, RAM did have sufficient information on all hospitals to show what the uh, participating in uh, groups did, employer groups, what they are paying as a percent of Medicare for those hospital facilities. Again, I wanted to point out the issue on physician costs. Now, I found this really interesting because uh, the Medicare disallowed costs. Uh, Mary Hitchcock, uh, you would assume, did not include in their report, so they had none to disallow. Or maybe they don't have a large physician practice. I don't know the particulars of that hospital. But you do want to take a look at the physician professional direct patient services reported that were disallowed, 162 million for University of Vermont Medical Center. But you definitely know that structure better than I do. Um, again, the physician exceeding reasonable comp, 
that is the amount that Medicare disallowed, but we allowed it in our tool. And then finally, what Medicare does allow, what was classified as uh, definitely the uh, hospital services provided. So it probably raises more questions than answers. I think it's a, a good chunk to to look at in conjunction with your other tools. We're finding, we're working extensively with um, uh, employer plans on this, and it has raised questions that uh, are good to have a discussion with when you're negotiating prices. Now, when I negotiated in Montana, uh, there were uh, two hospital systems and one private hospital that were holdouts and uh, declared that Medicare did not pay them sufficiently enough and Medicaid they were at a loss on. So I used a much rudimentary copy of this worksheet to try to calculate that, to look at some fact-based evidence that we could continue our discussions with. So I propose this as a model that is available for anyone to use. It doesn't require any special knowledge. Uh, the tool, uh, is an Excel-based tool. It tells you what worksheet, what line, what column to go to to insert numbers to do these calculations. And we have completed the tool for all of these hospitals and we'll be forwarding those to you. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Marilyn. So at this point, I will open it up to um, questions. Um, Elena, did you want to go first? Oh boy, um, sure. Uh, can you all hear me? And I, I apologize. I, okay. I'm unfortunately gonna have to hop off in a couple of minutes. Sorry. Okay, so I'll, can I ask a quick question right. to you, Chris? Um, yes. yes. I, I was just wondering if you could talk about the covariates um, that you might, you know, that you have considered and some of the policy recommendations you made. You know, Vermont is a pretty unique area. So are there any that you think are particularly generalizable um, to a small state such as ours um, or other areas of interest you think we should consider? Yeah, so uh, the, I, I think the things that maybe would be especially applicable are in APCD to monitor prices. And I, I think that's something that applies to every single state. And so it sounds like you are already well along that path. And so that's great to hear. And then I think the, the other thing that is um, potentially a, a workable model for workers like Vermont is actually building on the program that Maryland developed for the state of Montana that thinks about capping prices and, and benchmarking at least relative to Medicare. And I think as you're thinking about monitoring hospital prices, that's just a easy way to think about what's the the relative uh, standardization across providers and something that at least for, for state plans and, and other employer groups is, is a model that has been shown in the past to to save quite a bit and and also frankly just make the, the you know, I think one of the, the key challenges on thinking about prices is that the nature of the price negotiation process, where it varies by hospital by hospital, uh, is just so confusing uh, and and leaves a. It's hard to to think of a simple system to uh, to do to address prices in a more straightforward manner. And so I think rather than thinking about kind of the um, prices for specific services or discounts and charges, et cetera. If you think about just what's the multiple of Medicare and how that maybe varies across hospitals, I think that's just something that's more straightforward. Great. Does Thank anyone you. have questions for Chris um, so that we can let him uh, get on to his next engagement? Hey, Kevin, it's Walter. Yes, Walter. Uh, I just have one question for Chris and for the second presentator as well let's just so focus on chris for now walter you can come well, back to, to maryland simple, later very simple question one is why why are hospital costs so high that's <laughs> none of the presentators answered that 
so I, I think, I mean, so that's a big question. And a lot of it, I think, builds upon some of Maryland's work where you can see that there are variation in the cost to, to run a hospital. And so I guess the, maybe the, the question that may be uh, more applicable is why, why are markups for private plans so high? And as, as Maryland shows in, in our, our work also uh, describes as well, there, there is a tremendous amount of variation in, in prices and in which would end up being markups across hospitals. And so I, I think the the reasons are pretty varied. And so some hospitals just have lots of brand power or reputation. So for example, in your market, the Dartmouth hospitals probably have lots of to negotiate prices because people want the, the Dartmouth and other academic medical centers in their in their network. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how well this applies to Vermont, but in many other markets, we see that, that high prices are, are driven by market consolidation and concentration. And so if you're the, the only game in town, then you can buy high price. Okay, so other questions? Go ahead. Other this questions? is Robin. Robin? Yeah, um, Chris, I just wanted to get a little bit better sense of uh, the extent of the Vermont data that you had available to you, because I, I, I know you said you didn't use the APCD, and it looked like from the report there are 120 self-insured employers, and I was just curious, you know, sort of the extent of the Vermont data. Yeah, so I think a lot of our Vermont data is spillover from the New Hampshire and the Maine CDs who live in the state care in, in Vermont. Thanks. Okay, more. Have a question. And, and, and I guess uh, on that note, so we are planning a, a round, uh, an additional next year, and so um, including the Vermont APCD, I think is is a really good thing that we could do to to look at kind of the, the full extent of price variation within Vermont. I have a question. Yeah, I had recognized Mort first. Um, okay. But go ahead, Dale. I I think I missed part of the exchange there and um because it, it sort of blocked out on the audio. My apologies. Um my question was simply that in the first presentation. When you start talking about shifting where people go to get their care based on that's the most affordable cost, I immediately started seeing this image of like in schools segregation. You would get segregation and with the segregation conveniently would be usually a correlating investment as far as what the school had for money to work with, what the quality of education was. Is that been looked at in your scenario in terms of down the road, five, 10 years, if everybody starts migrating into most affordable care, how does this play out? So, I do not believe anyone has looked at that, and I, and I guess if you if you are thinking, you know, what one thing to keep in mind is the what what it, many employers have done is shift patients out of high price and because of their high prices, high resource hospitals into more efficient, lower price hospitals. And so, if we're thinking about kind of the allocation of, of resources across the the hospital sector and the hospital industry, the, these are types of policies that tend to actually increase the, the level of resources for, for lower price hospitals. Okay, Mark Stanislaus. Hi, Chris, thank you very much for your time and the information today, by the way. Um, I'm just curious, um, as we look at pricing as a percent of Medicare, you have to consider the numerator and the denominator. And the state of Vermont has a high number of critical access hospitals that is paid on the cost base. And just because you see a lower percentage of Medicare doesn't mean they're at a lower cost. 
So is there any sensitivity analysis where that can be done as it relates to that? Yeah, th th that's exactly right. And so we, we do see uh, in, in Vermont and in also Maine, there are lots of critical hospitals. And so that, that's where the, kind of the secondary measure of the standardized price that doesn't bake in the relative to Medicare amount is is actually a good comparison. And so from the procedure specific results, uh, I, I glossed over them pretty quickly, but we have both measures of prices and we do see that there are many kind of prices, hospitals are kind of low priced to Medicare because they're critical access hospitals, but still have high standardized prices. Okay. Thank you. So I don't That's see any other- Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up at this point. Um, Chris, if we have uh, further questions, could we email them to you? Absolutely. And um, uh, happy to share my, if you want to pass along my email, Kevin, that's fine. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And uh, we thank you for the time that you've given us. It's been uh, greatly uh, helpful. So thank you. So now we'll move to questions for Marilyn. Thank you. Marilyn, I'm going to jump on your teaser because you teased me a little bit when you talked about the uh, hospitals that um, opted uh, out of uh, your negotiations at the beginning. And um, it you seem like someone who's very tenacious. Can you tell me what's happened since then? <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Marilyn. That's because I have a cocker spaniel who is having a heyday out there. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, yeah, um, I started this process in Montana in summer of 2015, and I made the decision that this is going to be in place. Every Montana hospital will be reimbursed a multiple of Medicare by July 2016. So I have one year to get it done. And the two big hospital systems, well, they're not big compared to back east, okay. Uh, but one had two hospitals, one has three hospitals, and uh, they did not want to move. And they were my higher priced ones. And uh, what they did was a lot of lobbying with the governor's office to be able to do their own ACO, uh, do other programs, do narrow networks, whatever. But we made the decision, we're going to move forward without them because they were basically in areas where we had another hospital that had signed on. So we did not do like last and final offer sort of thing. We did, uh, this is it. If you don't want to be a network, that's fine. And we did travel benefits for members. Uh, they ended up all signing on uh, by July 1, except for one independent hospital. And they went in the newspaper and said, we can't do this for the state of Montana because that would be giving them better pricing than we give Blue Cross Blue Shield. And that opened a whole heyday of a conversation. And uh, by August 6th, they signed. So we have right now, it, it, we ended up with all Montana hospitals uh, signing. Super. Super. Questions for Marilyn from the board first, and then I'll open it up to public comment. Hi, Marilyn. Marilyn. This is Tom. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I, I'm just curious. As we have this uh, January 1st new federal rule coming out on uh, being implemented on price transparency, and I'm just wondering if you have any sense as how your work and Chris's work will line up against uh, um, you know, th th that, that data source? Um, I think any transparency is good. I think that the more you can look at this from different angles is really important. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, I think it will be another way to look at hospital costs. I think that's good. I think that we will still have that tool out there as perhaps one other angle of looking at the costs. Now, what we're trying to do is like be able to separate it by payer mix, like just like Chris is doing, uh, be able to, comp uh, Chris is definitely comparing it to what Medicare would reimburse, which is more of a cost plus basis versus a discount thing. So I think it will just enhance the conversation. Okay, Jess. Yeah, I took two questions for you, Marilyn. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering, you know, using the cost reports as a basis for all, for the analysis, um, 
my sense is, and I could be wrong about this, but that hospital designation has an impact on how how much the hospitals rely on the cost report. So the critical access hospitals, you know, focus a lot of their attention and energy around you know their cost reports. I'm wondering, is there a difference in how uh, cost reports are interpreted for you know other types of hospital designations, uh, you know, academic medical centers, et cetera? Do we have to think differently about this tool as it applies to different types of hospitals? Well, that's a really good question, and your uh, group uh, would be able to discuss that much better than I can. I think that it tends to try to make hospitals apples to apples, but you're right. Our tool is looking at whether it's a sole community hospital, is it a critical access hospital, is it eligible for low payment ratio payments, et cetera. And so it factors all of that in. Um, we are able to carve out just critical access hospitals to compare them. One of the things that we are doing is we are working with Rice University and uh, they are linking the tool to the HICRIS database so that they may get that report for the whole nation as well as specific states by classification of hospitals, et cetera. And the example is I have been doing a lot of work with Colorado and their healthcare and policy uh, or group uh, has linked the tool to HICRIS for Colorado and been able to do benchmarks by hospital type, by bed size, by be able to get medians so that they can better compare by hospital types. And I think that is important to look at. You know, you don't want to compare a critical access hospital with 25 beds to a hospital with 1,000 beds. So they're taking a cut at the data, and Rice University is too, to see if there is that comparison. Great, thank you. Um, we may have to follow up with you and learn about how they're, you know, how that worked out. Um, the other question was around that break-even level analysis, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I'm just wondering what kind of feedback you've gotten from hospitals uh, about that particular analysis, and are there uh, caveats to the interpretation of that, or? You know, just wondering what the hospital response has been to that particular tool, if there has been yet. There has been some. Uh, we've worked with five independent hospitals in another state and two large hospital systems in another state. Um, the two large hospital systems, we gave them the report and said, tell us where we're going wrong, what's going on, send it to your corporate office that does these reports. Both of them came back and didn't have issues on how we were calculating. Both of them said, you've got to include all of the physician costs because we're losing money on that. And that's an interesting question because um, why did hospitals buy large physician practices if they're a loss leader? Was it to help with referrals? Was it to provide a broader base of support for their hospital? It's a good thing to open up that discussion. We had one hospital say, um, well, on the break-even point, we're losing a lot of money on our nursing home, and we feel the hospital payments should cover the losses of our other facilities. So we got those kind of discussions that, you know, are up to the people that are making those calls on negotiations, whether those should be covered or not. What do you feel your community needs? How should those be paid? Um, I did do some analysis on what those hospitals were bringing in as far as profits from 340B that aren't reported, and we dug into that a little bit more. Now, I'm about to really open up. I mean, I think I'll just put the target on me right now. We're meeting with three very large systems in Indiana and have done the report there, and they're going to be providing me feedback. Uh, we are also opening it up to a very, very large, large health system that has six hospitals in Texas. And uh, so we'll be getting more feedback and we're more than open to if that tool needs to be changed. Uh, so far, I guess a long answer to your, your quick question, Jessica, is that it's a good thing to start the dialogue to find what hospitals find between that break-even point and what they're charging why do you need that extra money? 
And the the things that have come up now is pretty much to supplement other things they're in than that direct hospital. And, and that may be appropriate or not. It's not for me to decide. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Other questions from the board? Um, yes. Uh, uh, first, I really appreciate all the analysis that you did. And, you know, it's, it's one of the things we've been looking at, too, is that benchmark against against Medicare. When we look at the Vermont hospitals, you know, they're actual where they actually end up in a year, you know, many of them lose money or make, you know, two to three um, percent. And, you know, as you're going through this process to try to really pressure, which I, I think um, is worthwhile to be to be looking at it this way, you know, what what should be charged and how does the relationship to Medicare, if they're being brought down and those numbers are coming down for commercial payers. And one of the things that we always ask the hospitals about are, are their efficiencies, their cost saving programs and things like this. So if nothing else changes other than them charging a lower price for commercial, right, then they're going to be making less revenue. You know, how, how, what success are you having in seeing that those expenses are coming down um, in order to be able to make some margin um, that they do need at the bottom line to be able to, you know, to sustain? So just question there, because uh, that's the challenge we get. We, we can look at the numbers and say they look high. You no, know, very, very good point. You know, this tool does not tell you if the revenues are too low or the costs are too high. And it will not tell you that. Uh, we are looking at some efficiency measures. We, and, and your group, I'm sure, has already done that. We've been working with Rand a little bit on some metrics of risk-based uh, inpatient cost per you know, discharge, we're looking at some other efficiency metrics. We've also been able to plug in um, overhead, hospital overhead, um, as a percentage of total salaries. We've been, we're, we're trying to do that next because I don't have an answer for you. I do say when you have that profit margin, I can see there's the tendency to say, but we lower revenues and you're going to be in a loss situation. What happens then? So I go back to you'd have to lower costs too to maintain that. And are costs too high? I don't know that. It requires a lot more analysis. Because I think obviously the other part of that mix is the Medicaid reimbursement, which in many cases is significantly lower than Medicare. So even if Medicare was functioning more around a break even, um, commercial is offsetting that loss that hospitals are making on Medicaid. You know, that's that's what we're hearing, right? I'm, I'm just saying, how does that work in this mix? Because you didn't really do anything against kind of a Medicaid comparison as well. Yeah, it's tough. And I think your group can figure that out because the way our tool is built, these uh, supplemental payments that are coming in, a lot of hospitals will record those differently. So you can kind of see now within Montana, when I did it, I was surprised. Um, the hospital association really took on what I was doing and said that Medicaid was reimbursing 40% and Medicare was reimbursing 60%. Now, Montana has 11 acute care hospitals, and that made up 87% of my Montana hospital spend. So that's where I put my effort because our 48 critical access hospitals were only 13% of our plan spent. So I looked at those acute care hospitals and I saw that on average, uh, Medicaid was paying, because we have such large uh, CMS payments, Medicaid was reimbursing 97% of their costs and Medicare was reimbursing 93% of their costs. So you really have to dig to try to figure that out, uh, those different components, but every state different on how they handle those funds and come in. Um, yeah, you, you do have to look at that. And you will hear that argument from hospitals that Medicare and Medicaid don't pay. And I, as part of the state employee health plan, I was fine making up that difference. I mean, that was part of what I felt the state taxpayer dollars and our governor's directive to me was. But at first I needed to get, what is that? What is that number? And then let's go from there. But uh, you do open the whole issue of our costs too high, our revenues too low. 
And and one final question. The other, you know, big contributor we'll hear on the bottom line um, is the 340B programs that are in there. So when we, we're looking at these net income um, that you're looking at, and and still, you know, overall for most of the Vermont hospitals, it's in that you know two to four percent range for bottom line net income with probably a big contributor being 340B, which would would possibly mean that, you know, everything else is is underwater, right? So, I'm, you know, when you look at that break-even analysis, I'm just wondering, you know, how that factors in there as well, because it's almost like you need to take the net income and adjust for it for things that may be a major contributor in the bottom line. So I think so. You really do need to do it, which your group does much much more in depth. Now on 340B, what's interesting, what I found in Montana is the hospital sharing of 340B savings, sharing it with insurance companies, sharing it with employer plans. Those are some issues that we dealt with, is that um, uh, the intent of the 340B program, although the law is so vague, it doesn't say how the 340B savings should be spent. And what we're finding more and more of is that that's being shared, especially with uh, contracted pharmacies. You'll find like Humira, uh, the 340B price is a penny. And my state health plan was paying $5,000. The contract pharmacy retained a thousand of it. And then the rest went to the hospital. And then what you saw insurance companies doing was splitting that savings. So that's an area of interest too, that maybe indirectly could benefit the hospital more, but then it hurts the the premium payer, you would think, if you saw those 340B savings go to premium dollars. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's very interesting. Elena, I saw that you had a question. No. I guess we're going to move to uh, public comment then. And um, the order that I have the uh, hand so far is Sarah Teachout, Mort Wasserman, and Mike Del Treco. So, Sarah Teachout. This is Abigail. Sarah can't get off mute with her current setup. So, um, I can read her question out loud for her. Um, okay. How did the travel piece work for patients? Were there issues with access to care? by excluding a hospital from the network? Um, that's a really good question. Um, there were two hospital, uh, uh, the group that would not sign in three of the cities, there were two hospitals. So there was access. There was only one city that had one hospital and uh, they were 60 miles from the closest. And uh, they did have, actually, they had two hospitals in it, too. Forget it. All the towns had two hospitals. Now, there was some specialty care that was provided at the one hospital. It was in Great Falls, Montana. And uh, we had nurse case managers uh, working to reroute the care the best we could. Um, one thing that really, really helped me is that the union was supportive of what we were doing and we worked with union leadership extensively and they worked with their members to help me and um so there was a lot of lobbying by the union members a lot of letter writing a lot of opinions uh and once the hospital came out and said they couldn't give us better than blue cross blue shield it was the union group and the union leadership that took over with letters and when we were finally able to negotiate uh, with that hospital, that was the main pressure. But you raise a really good issue, and, and it's a tough one because uh, in, the state employees were very much used to going wherever they wanted and not having a narrow network. Um, we got slammed by the hospital association for having uh, not having network adequacy. Uh, we actually did a very... Uh, ingenious thing. It was not my idea. It was our TPA uh, to deal with that. But uh, we ended up with just having to implement the travel ban benefit in one hospital. I think the public pressure was pretty tough because that's taxpayer money uh, that's really funding that. 
Okay, thank you. Marilyn, could you just say what the travel benefit was for folks who aren't aware? Oh, certainly. Um, the travel benefit was um, we would pay for the mileage, the hotel stay, depending on certain items. There were some procedures that could be done at our on-site health centers, a lot of primary care visits, and then we had one in Helena, 60 miles away, and that's no copay, no uh, co-insurance, labs, et cetera. And as a result, that started some steerage those six weeks before they signed, and people ended up staying with that. So it took some of that business away. But it was mainly, oh, I can't even remember, but we did the mileage, the lodging. Uh, we had our uh, case managers uh, really on top of that, also trying to see how we might be able to waive some other things. Can't was remember. the mileage based on federal reimbursement? I can't remember, to be honest with you. Okay. I can't remember what it was. Okay. Okay, more? Thank you. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation. And this question may be because I'm in the remedial health care wow. economics yeah. course. But what can your model, or to the extent you understand it, the RAND model, tell us about the effectiveness of alternative payment models that ACOs can offer with partial capitation or, or other tools, bundled payments, is there anything we can learn from these tools about those models, how well they work? You know, I have not delved into that that much. The states that I'm working with, we have not gone that path. My limited, you're going to be so much more knowledgeable than I am on this. My limited exposure to the ACO models that I've worked with have been more around um, primary care, more around managing the care. I mean, when it comes down to doing an appendectomy, it's still fee for service. And some, you know, there, I'm, I'm going to probably say I'm not going to answer that because I have not really delved into that that much, but it's a valid question. Okay. Um, Mike Del Treco, I see your hand is down. Did you have your question answered or? You know, my question wasn't answered. I just put it down because I thought you had the list going, Kevin. Okay. So you should see me on screen now and I should be off mute. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, cool. Um, Marilyn and uh, Chris, I know you're not there, but thanks for a thorough presentation. I, I you know, being a, whether being fortunate to have filed many cost reports by hand and or doing it electronically, whether that's a good fortune or a, or a, or a curse, um, I've done such things like that. And sort of the question that I um, think about when we file cost reports, you know, in the years where they're being used, I, I just would um, uh, politely and respectfully throw caution to how our current all payer model um, interacts with filed cost reports that you may have uh, pulled. I'm not saying the data is wrong. I'm not saying, um, I just don't know how that may have impacted your your results. So just something to, to think about. Um, Maureen, I really liked your sort of line of questioning around sort of how we balance expenses uh, and revenues and the 340B conversation. Um, and, and I think in Although maybe indirectly, I think our Green Mountain Care Board has largely um, the ability to manage sort of looking at 340B growth uh, dollars and then and then managing um, and making recommendations or budget orders to our hospitals around uh, charge increases to those commercial carriers. Although it may not be a perfect equation to say 340B revenues equal this amount and, and you know, it's it's uh, X percent of the of the of uh, net patients of excuse me of operating revenue um, uh, to gross charges. The mindful thing I want to put on the table is that in Vermont, our 340B represents a hundred percent of our hospital's operating margin, not not eighty percent, not seventy percent, not a hundred percent. So our services to patients 
um, do not cover, just cover operating expenses. Um, so that's another thing that I think we have to sort of uh, think about. And then, um, Marilyn, just to, to touch on the subjective thought around why hospitals, and I didn't like the word buy practices, um, because I don't think our Vermont hospitals have purchased practices. I think we're in this, this situation where our payer mix in Vermont is largely uh, governmental, and in order to preserve uh, access in communities, uh, hospitals have really brought practices on to um, to meet the needs of their community. And and some of our hospitals would say, at the time we brought some of these services on, we've actually seen more challenges to our bottom line. So just a few points, but really uh, thank you for a uh, pretty comprehensive outline and uh, appreciate your time. Great points, Mike. I didn't see a question in there, so um, no we'll question. Go on. No question. Okay, so um, next is going to be Mike Fisher, and after Mike is going to be Dale. Mike. Um, good afternoon, and thank you. Thank you to both both uh, presenters, uh, Marilyn. I really want to start by recognizing you. I I, I uh, I'm, I'm the healthcare advocate, which means I have uh, my team has a role in hospital budgets uh, uh, over the years. And uh, we've been asking the question about costs as a percent of, me of Medicare for a few years now, maybe two, maybe longer. Um, and I understand that the question, the concept of it originally uh, came from you. So thank you. Um, and I'll also note that I, uh, I still feel, we still have work to do uh, to to feel confident that we're getting an apples to apples comparison that that the hospitals are responding to that question in a uh, using the same methodology. Um, so there's more work to do on that. Um, and then the the question is, I, I really uh, it's interesting to me. I really wanted to give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, are there other lessons learned from Montana um, that you think would be useful to us? And I, I think you know the the one concept that comes up to me is. Uh, you know, over time, um, did it help stabilize costs or or did you see uh, too much pressure being put on hospitals' uh, bottom lines? I, I really wanted to open up to you if there are other lessons learned that you think would be useful to us. Oh, thank you, Mike. That's a really thoughtful question. Um, again, as far as the critical access hospitals, um, I we negotiated lower prices on three of them and all three were owned by acute care hospitals. The remaining of them, we didn't touch. So our situation's different than Vermont's. Um, I do want to throw that out there. As far as what we saw is after we did this, the Montana Association of Counties has a trust for county employees, and then the Montana Interlocal Municipal Authority has a plan for cities. They went on the similar plan and had significant savings so that they could get that. We then had a, a private employer, Pacific Hyden Fur, a large private employer out of uh, Great Falls come in after we had hit Great Falls and they put in the same plan. So the population got bigger. Um, no hospital has change services. We did see a couple of higher level positions were let go. Um, whether they related to that, I am not sure. Um, we did see uh, charge masters not increase by hospitals for a year or so. Um, we did not have, uh, we did not see any downfall from that in Montana. It was kind of interesting because it almost became competitive on the hospital side because our approach was to look at what the hospitals were paying as a multiple of Medicare on our own claims. And then we could see one average 611% of Medicare for outpatient, while one was averaging 237% of Medicare for outpatient. So why that difference? And we were able to talk to hospitals through that and the glide path brought this one down. So we already had about four hospitals that were operating at the range we wanted to be. And we began, and they had good quality numbers. And we began calling them the efficient hospitals. And 
uh, it became almost competition of, well, we can do the same. So it was a weird kind of thing that happened that I didn't expect. So we have not seen anything, you know, negative come out of that. The one thing when I was doing this that I really delved into that continues to be something as a sideline that kind of hits on what you're asking is what's in that community benefit bucket that you report for 990. The biggest chunk is subsidized services. And that stuff is not easy to find that detail. Um, then what I was able to show when they uh, are able to declare um, the difference between Medicaid charge master and Medicaid fee schedule, you know, that was kind of disturbing to me because what my numbers were coming up different than that. And since I had the bulk of that information through the large hospitals. And then when I started delving into subsidized services, and again, this was back, I had to use a 2014 report and it may have changed. I found in subsidized services was the difference between charge master and insurance contracts as subsidized services. So I think it opened up a can of worms that others are looking at for the bigger community benefit. You know, that may not apply to you, but it did here that that's kind of what people started looking at. I, um, we, it also opened up with what other uh, businesses do you have? What other things do you operate that you may be losing money on? And is that needed for the community or is that a joint venture that maybe doesn't fit? So it opened up a lot of questions, mainly for legislators. They're the ones that are pursuing this, certainly not me. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. You're muted, Mike. Thank you. Uh, I think that's a really that's a, a really useful conversation. I, I, thanks. I think the thing to point out of interest too was that um, Montana ended up. We were going to be at minus nine million in reserves in two and a half years. Instead, we had 112 million to the good. We had more money than the general fund. Hmm. And we, they started borrowing money from me, which was fine because I could charge interest on it. But then they did pass legislation, which was appropriate because this was taxpayer money. They passed legislation to pull 25 million back into the state. Um, the plans ended up 2019 before COVID because we did this ratcheting in with uh, there's a recommended reserve level to cover IBNR and liabilities. And the plan then was 54 million above that. So I would think you're gonna see more money come, which is appropriate. Um, so I think there were other things we did in addition to this though, big things that we did, other things. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, from my mind, as Chris said in his thing, I felt I was fiduciary of that plan. I didn't have a choice. I had to manage every penny in there for, for the members. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to Dale Hackett. Yes, my question is, and the beginning of her presentation, she mentioned Colorado. And since my kids live there and I've actually been there, it brought up this visualization of a hospital in Denver versus a hospital halfway up in the Rockies in one of those towns that you can't even see it. And you, you take this 2000 foot drop on a road to get to it. There's no way out. There's only that one road. How does demographics like that fit into where these hospitals are located, how charges work out? I mean, rule out there, Vermonters don't know rule. They <laughs> they just don't. I mean, they call Rochester rule here. I would say that's that's a big valley that's almost flat compared to out there. You know, I think um, we've got the same in Montana with 48 critical access hospitals and we're the fourth largest state. But uh, I would say within Colorado, this is one data point they can look at. They have a very, very good uh, healthcare financing and policy agency. 
that is really looking at all aspects of hospital care and all they are definitely taking into consideration everything you said where are hospitals uh, what kinds of services should be uh, that goes into your whole community needs um, so i think that this is just one tool to compare but then there are a lot of other tools to determine what's needed and uh so it's just one part of that bigger puzzle that you raise. But it's also to say, should the Denver hospital, and again, I, I, I'm I not able to share those details, but you would say a, a Denver that maybe has six hospitals, large hospitals, that's where this tool kind of helps with some comparisons. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next we're gonna go to Mark Stanislaus. Hi, Marilyn, thank you very much for your presentation um, and your thoughtfulness so far to all of the answers. I have a couple um, just technical questions well to understand some of the graphs, but when you say break even, that doesn't in, that doesn't include any profit margin. Absolutely not. That's your base lowest yep. just break even and that's not what you're going to pay. You know, you're going to what I we've been working with a couple of employer plans in negotiating with hospitals and definitely a profit margin comes in as well as what other contributions to your initiatives that are not specifically hospital care uh, would we want to contribute to. So it's it's just a baseline. Yep. OK, yep. And 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 then um, and this is if I understood it, but when you take a look at your payer mix, you're evaluating that payer mix um, based upon the volume of services or i.e. gross charges. Gross charges. Charges, okay, gross charges, not net payments. Right. Okay, and, 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 and then this is just more of informational. I thought you made the reference to Medicare Advantage programs that they fall under the commercial category. Thank you. Okay, so well, so it's just, you know, coming from the only academic medical center in the state, a lot of our Medicare Advantage programs are actually negotiated on Medicare rates. So I just worry if that could convolute what you really think the payer mix is, if it's actually, because, you know, those are Medicare patients. Um, uh, um, uh, they they are just qualifying for a different plan. Like most of our negotiated plans, basically they're negotiated on the Medicare rate. Right? Um, and then, well, just from a curiosity, what's the provider tax in the state of Montana? Oh my gosh, it is, um, well, it's $50 an inpatient bed stay and 1% of outpatient uh, gross Revenue. Gross, okay. Yeah, okay. And 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 then, you know, um how do you balance this if you happen to be the only only tertiary care, coronary care center within the state, okay, for a state that has a very low population? The I state of Vermont ha has a very low population and 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 it's just thinking out loud that if you want specialty care in state and if that specialty care is 24 7 you know you need 3.2 physician ftes say to cover um a pediatric pulmonary service so um and 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 then the other thing within that too is 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 that you know we also own all of the renal dialysis services with the state and you know where they're not big money makers so you know um you know that's also if you turn to cost to make up the difference to the break even as you kind of said that was the equation i think there are certain costs that hosp hospitals can can choose to shut off but that doesn't lower the cost of healthcare in the state because the patients still need to go elsewhere so i was curious and and i mean it is really different if you're really in a, a competitive market, candidly. So, um, and you don't need to answer all of that. And 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 then the other thing too is, I think Vermont's the first or second oldest state, and the and older people utilize more services. And so, how that falls into that equation too? I know Montana's not a young state either, by the way. No, and I'm representative of that. Okay, well, I, that's not what I was implying. Hey, I, <laughs> hey, I actually speak of that. Um, so. 
Well, did they run you out of Montana yet? No, not yeah. yet. Boy, but we're sure getting a lot of people coming in, aren't we? Yes, um, you are actually very young people. Yeah. We are, but I did want to say, I think, you know, some of the things you brought up, I think we have mentioned that this is just the hospital services only, and it opens up the discussion, whether it be an employer group or your board, what other services might not be included in here that may be running at a loss leader that are important for your citizens of Vermont? That's a discussion. That's nothing I have an opinion on. Um, I would uh, say that uh, it, a lot of your focus is more what is needed for Vermont. And that's certainly nothing I have knowledge on. I know that within Montana, the discussion came up on an advanced pediatric care unit. And uh, it was tried in Montana, but for Montanans, the solution is to either go to Denver, Salt Lake or Seattle, and it's become part of the culture. So there, there are just a lot of different things, and I think you brought up a list of things that go beyond just the pure mathematics into more the policy that your board looks at. Well, thank you very much, and it was a very good conversation. Um, appreciate your time and listening in to both you and Chris. Thank you. Okay, Robin Alvis. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, Marilyn, this is really very fascinating, and I think um, y y you really do have a lot of insights, and, and I appreciate, you know, your comments and, and quick to point out how Vermont may be different from Montana, but, but there are some similarities as well. A couple of questions I had um, had to do with um, macro issues in the state, and you mentioned a couple of things that suggested to me um, that you really did have a multi-stakeholder approach to return it, to reducing some of the cost with policymakers with your TPA around the travel restrictions, um, and and that's really something that um, that everyone can be rowing in the right direction on are those macro issues that that add to the cost. So could you speak to a little bit about about that? And was your T and then secondly were um, was your TPA part of your state Blue Cross or was it a, another commercial TPA? Okay. Very good questions. Uh, when I decided I wanted to do this reference-based pricing and all of this, I issued an RFP. I fired, uh, it, we had a very large carrier was our TPA and I fired them because I couldn't get my data from them and they thought my idea was stupid. <laughs> and how did I know? Maybe it was, but, um, I did an RFP and I think we had about nine respondents and only one said they would put this in place and it was an independent TPA, a smaller TPA. I did not have one single national carrier want to take this on. I had a large carrier say, we will give you uh, discounts that approximate, but I wanted to move away from charge master less discount. So that was it. So we moved to a smaller one. And then your other question was on, oh, it was a good one and I missed it. It was on the travel benefit and. Some uh, of the macro, the macro issues, oh. uh, reliance upon policymakers or, um, you know, that sensitivity to the travel bans. Those are unpopular decisions, but we know that they work to reduce cost. They do work to reduce cost. And there I, uh, it wasn't, uh, I had two real supporters in the budget director and my uh, director of administration, and they were the ones that worked to get the union on board. And once the union was on board and uh, the legislature in 2015 had made the promise that if we could get the health plan costs under control, there would be pay raises. So that was some leverage. And sure enough, when 2017 came around, the health plan didn't need money. In fact, gave it back and there were pay raises. But it was the union and whatever they did to really mobilize the forces that really, really did help me. It was also transparency in that the information we got, we were sharing with the hospitals, we shared with the public, we shared this transparency and people could kind of see what was going on and could help us. One thing I wasn't prepared for were the legislators that mandated this be done, all of a sudden they also sit on the hospital board of directors. 
And so that kind of slammed me. But um, there were those more macro levels of communication with employees, and we did hire a marketing firm who did wonderful, wonderful little video snippets on what we were doing and why. We made commitments to employees and that group that if you can help us with this, this is what we'll do. And you will have no, in fact, you're going to have enhanced benefits. We will have no increases in premiums, and there haven't been for five years. So we made those commitments if we, if you'll help us. And there, and again, it was the unions, I'd have to say. Okay, I'm not seeing any other uh, public comment. So, Marilyn, we wish to uh, thank you for being so, so. Kevin, so, so, Kevin, this is Ham. Could I get a question? Sure, Ham. I didn't see your hand raised. Go ahead. I don't have a hand. I'm just it's too technical for me. Sorry, Kevin. Uh, this is a question <laughs> from Marilyn. Uh, the, it's very interesting to look at Ma Montana, which is a small rural state, very like uh, significantly like Vermont. But my question is this. Um, I've done some research out there myself in the whammy states, Washington, Montana, Alaska, and Idaho. And I'm curious, well, and I know this is kind of a hard question, but I, I wonder if you could say the extent to which your success, however you define it, in Montana, uh, depended on the University of Washington and Seattle services. They deliver, they do your medic, they do your, they educate your doctors. They have very strong commitment at, in, at UW Seattle to primary care, and they insist. Uh, that they that their graduates, a lot of their graduates, go into primary care. I'm just curious whether you would, whether you, you just whether you could guess whether your success would have been in, as great in Mon in Montana if you had if you were standing alone without UW Seattle helping you. Um, I can't really answer that directly, but for primary care, we do not rely on the commercial market. We have five on-site health centers that serve 73% of the members, and that is independent of the hospital system. It's a vendor that handles that. So our primary care, health coaching, um, referrals to specialty, most of that occurs in our on-site health centers in five different cities. And one of them is located, UW is mainly working with Providence Systems in Missoula. And uh, we have a health center in, in Missoula, and UW is working with only one of the hospitals. Uh, there's Community Medical Center and our health center, and UW works with St. Pat's, one of the hospitals in Missoula. And the state population in Missoula, now the university population is high, but the state population is in Helena. Uh, over 65% of the employees were in Helena. So it's hard to say the UW had a big play in it, but I can't quantify that. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Marilyn. We really thank appreciate you. it. And um, we'll be in touch, thank you. Thank you. So at this point in time on the agenda, we are going to move towards um, a discussion of the uh, benchmark rates. And Sarah Lindbergh, are you on the line? I am. Okay, if you could just summarize uh, what our motion should be and uh, so on, it would be very helpful. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I come before you um, with a recommendation that we revise the methodology for the um, benchmark for the 2020 Medicare program with One Care Vermont. Uh, the motion would be that we use a retrospective trend to account for the uncertainty in the uh, COVID related times. So I'm not uh, very good with words, but I would say the motion would be to re revise our proposal to Medicare to use a retrospective trend for the 2020 benchmark. So member Lunge, would you like to put that in the form of a motion? Sure, I would be happy to. Um, but Mike, can I ask Mike a quick question, which I didn't yeah. think about before the meeting, Mike Barber. Yep. Um, so during hospital budgets, when we wanted to revise our decision first, we needed to move to to modify the 
the decision and then move for the change. Do you want me to handle it that way? Is Mike Barber on or who's our lawyer today? I assumed it was Mike. Mike Barber, are you on? Yeah, sorry, I had to thought I was off mute, but I guess I wasn't. Oh, sorry. Um I think you I would I would propose that you make it can well, I don't think you need to do that. Um because my understanding of what's happening here is uh in the event that CMS is modifying the existing benchmark as they have the ability to do under their contract with one care we want to be involved in that and so if that is taking place then um we're going to be proposing this retrospective trend so i don't think you need to redo what was already done and kind of reconsider that um if that makes sense yep that makes sense okay just wanted to double check all right so then i move that uh, we propose a revision to the 2020 Medica Medicare ACO benchmark for One Care Vermont to be a retrospective trend to account for the uncertainty uh, with COVID-19. Is there a second? Second. Is there a board discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up to any public comment before a vote. Would anybody wish to offer any public comment on the motion um, to um, change to a retrospective Medicare benchmark? Hearing none, um, anything further from any board member? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. You too. So is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. Enjoy what uh, appears to be a, a little heat wave going on here in Vermont. <laughs> For now.